you're sitting in a jury box. Day three of a murder trial. The prosecutor stands up and walks you through the evidence. No DNA, no fingerprints, no witnesses who actually saw the defendant commit the crime. But then she paints you a picture. Ladies and gentlemen, look at the defendant. He's a 34-year-old man with a history of domestic violence. He's been unemployed for six months. He has a gambling problem. He was seen at a bar near the victim's house the night of the murder, drinking heavily and acting aggressively toward women. He owns a knife similar to the murder weapon. She pauses, looks each of you in the eye. Now, which is more likely? That this man is simply someone who happened to be in the area that night? Or that this man is someone who was in the area that night, who was drunk and angry, who had financial problems and a history of violence against women, and who committed this murder? Your brain immediately screams, the second one. Obviously, the second one. It's so much more specific. It fits together. Nine out of ten jurors in the room are nodding. This feels like logic. This feels like justice. But you've just been tricked. And so has everyone else in that courtroom. The second statement, the one that feels more likely, is actually less probable than the first one, if you look at it in terms of simple math. And this trick has sent innocent people to prison. It's corrupted FBI criminal profiling. It's caused police to focus on the wrong suspects. It's made juries convict based on stories that feel true, but are mathematically impossible to be more likely than simpler alternatives. This cognitive illusion has a name, the conjunction fallacy, and it's so powerful that even people who understand probability fall for it when the story is compelling enough. But before I show you why your brain is lying to you about what's probable, let me tell you about Linda. Two psychologists named Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky write a simple paragraph and show it to college students. Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Then they ask, which is more probable? A. Linda is a bank teller. B. Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. Which one feels more likely? If you're like 85% of people, including 85% of graduate students who had taken multiple statistics courses. You said B. It makes sense, right? Linda sounds like someone who would be involved in feminism. Philosophy major, concerned with discrimination and social justice? That's someone who'd be active in feminist causes. But option B is mathematically impossible to be more probable than option A. Here's why. Every single person who fits description B must also fit description A. If Linda is a bank teller and a feminist, then she is definitely a bank teller. But not every bank teller is a feminist. Think of it like a Venn diagram. You have a circle of all bank tellers. Inside that circle, there's a smaller circle of bank tellers who are feminists. So the chance of Linda belonging to the big circle must always be higher than the chance of her belonging to the smaller circle inside it. This is basic set logic. This is a mathematical rule. The chance of two things both happening together is always less than, or at best equal to, the chance of one of those things happening alone. Whenever you add an extra detail, the statement automatically becomes less likely. But 85% of people get this wrong. Kahneman and Tversky called this the conjunction fallacy. The mistake of thinking that two conditions together can be more probable than one condition by itself. And it's not just about Linda. This fallacy is actively being used to convict people of crimes they didn't commit. Let's talk about criminal profiling. The FBI agent who looks at a crime scene and builds a detailed psychological profile of the perpetrator. We're looking for a white male, age 30 to 40, socially isolated, possibly with a history of animal cruelty, likely living alone, unemployed, or working a menial job, who drives an older model van. Sounds scientific, right? They're actually making the profile less likely to match the actual perpetrator with every detail they add. Let's run through this in simple math the way people normally speak. Say you're in a city of 1 million people, white male, age 30 to 40, maybe 5% fit that. That's about 50,000 people. Add socially isolated, living alone, maybe 30% of that group. Now you're at 15,000 people. Add history of animal cruelty, maybe 2%. Now you're down to roughly 300 people. Add drives an older van, maybe 2.5%. Now you're around 7 or 8 people. The profiler makes it sound like they've narrowed it down. But the truth is, with every added detail, they made it less and less likely to match the real person. If the actual criminal doesn't have a cruelty history or doesn't drive a van, the profile becomes useless, while police waste time chasing the tiny group who fit the overly specific description. This is the conjunction fallacy in action. The more specific the story, the less likely it is to match reality. 
but the more believable it sounds. And prosecutors use this same trick in courtrooms every single day. Let me show you how this plays out in trial. The prosecutor is building a case for armed robbery. The evidence is thin. No DNA, no fingerprints, one eyewitness who admits the lighting was poor. Prosecutors approach. The evidence shows the defendant committed this robbery. The jury thinks, maybe, but is there reasonable doubt? Prosecutors approach B. Let me tell you what really happened. The defendant needed money. He was three months behind on rent. He knew the victim carried cash. They worked at the same company two years ago. He waited until the victim left work late on Wednesday. He wore a hoodie to obscure his face, but the victim still recognized his walk, his voice, the tattoo on his left hand. This wasn't random. This was calculated. The jury leans forward. This is a story. This feels true, but it is actually less likely than approach A. Every added detail, the rent problem, the past connection, the Wednesday timing, makes the story more specific and therefore less probable. The chance of he committed the robbery is always higher than he committed the robbery and needed money and knew the victim and waited until Wednesday and each and lowers the probability, but it raises emotional conviction. Mock jury studies show that the more detailed the prosecution story is, even if the details aren't strongly supported, the more likely juries are to convict. A simple story with strong evidence is less convincing than a detailed story with weak evidence. Your brain mistakes a smooth narrative for truth. Kirk Bloodsworth is convicted of the rape and murder of a nine-year-old girl in Maryland. The evidence. Five eyewitnesses place someone matching his general description near the scene. He had reddish hair, was tall, and had no solid alibi. The prosecution built a story. Kirk Bloodsworth didn't just happen to be in the area. He matched the description. He was there. He had a violent temper. He was acting nervous when questioned. The jury convicted him. He was sentenced to death. Nine years later, DNA testing proved he didn't do it. The DNA matched a different man entirely. The prosecution built a detailed narrative that felt true. They took basic facts and added more and more detail. But mathematically, each additional detail made the story less likely to be accurate. He was in the area, maybe 5% of the population. In the area and matched description, maybe 1%. In the area and matched description and had no alibi, maybe 0.3%. In the area and matched description and no alibi and violent temper and nervous, maybe 0.05%. With every added detail, the prosecution made their case statistically weaker while making it sound stronger, and an innocent man nearly died because of it. Here's the tricky part. If the details are actually true, doesn't that make it more likely he's guilty? It depends on what you're comparing. Comparing he committed the crime with he committed the crime and had a violent temper and was nervous. The first one is always more probable. That's the conjunction fallacy. But comparing he committed the crime with he didn't commit the crime, then yes, evidence like violent temper can push the probability toward guilt. That's how Bayesian reasoning works. Prosecutors mix these two ideas up. They build detailed stories as if the details make guilt more likely, when the comparison should always be between simple guilt versus simple innocence. Here's why this matters. Imagine the chance of guilt based on basic facts is around 60%. The prosecutor adds 10 details to make a narrative. Say each detail is about 80% likely if the defendant is guilty. But if you want all 10 things to be true at the same time, you multiply the chances. And 80% repeated 10 times becomes roughly 10%. So the full narrative ends up with something like a 6% overall probability. A case that started at 60% became a story that's only around 6% likely, but it sounds more convincing. This is how innocent people get convicted. The FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit does this constantly. In the 1990s, profilers delivered incredibly specific profiles, but studies found that their most detailed predictions were usually wrong, while broad profiles were often accurate. Police departments felt more confident with detailed profiles. In reality, they were chasing fictional characters, and some prosecutors know detailed stories are more convincing, even when the evidence is weak, and they use this on purpose. The Innocence Project has exonerated over 375 people with DNA. Many were convicted because of detailed stories that weren't actually supported by evidence. He was in the area and matched description and had motive and had opportunity and acted suspicious and every and makes the story feel more believable. Every and also makes it mathematically less likely to be true. Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in 2002 for his work on how humans make decisions under uncertainty. 
The Linda problem proved that human intuition consistently violates basic probability rules. This fallacy has sent innocent people to prison. It's caused police to chase imaginary suspects. It's made juries choose stories instead of evidence. We are not built to think in probabilities. We are built to think in stories. Stories depend on details. Details feel true, but probability doesn't care about feelings. Linda is probably a bank teller. She might also be a feminist, but bank teller and feminist is automatically less likely than just bank teller. This is the conjunction fallacy. This is the glitch in human reasoning that makes us believe things that cannot be true if the story sounds good enough. If this could prevent a wrongful conviction, share it. If you've ever been convinced by a detailed story that seemed too specific to be false, hit that like button. Subscribe, because now that you know about the conjunction, fallacy, you'll see prosecutors, profilers, and con artists using it everywhere. And you'll never confuse a compelling story with a probable one again.